acronym is DISCOVER, um, and that looks at racial and ethnic disparities in chronic disease risk and burden and how to do better screening, treatment, and outcomes. So she um, does that at Palo Alto Medical Organization as well as volunteers at Dr. Scott Borders, and that will be our talk for today. So thank you for that introduction, and um, thank you all for coming today. And um, I'll be speaking for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions afterwards. Um, I'll just give you a little bit more of my history so you kind of know where I came from and what, how Dr. Zell Borders fit into my life. Um, so I did the uh, seven-year integrated pre-medical medical program at Michigan, and then I came out to Kaiser San Francisco for my internal medicine residency, and then I applied for a preventive cardiology fellowship at Stanford, and I also applied for an individual NRSA. It's called a National Research Scientist Award. It's an F32. They still have them. They're called Ruth Kirstein Awards. And so I, so I had planned to, you know, just go directly from internal medicine into preventive cardiology, but I kind of wanted to fit in Doctors Without Borders. And um, so I deferred. I got in, and then I deferred both of those things, both the NIH award and the um, fellowship. And um, I'm really glad I did that. Sometimes when you're at this stage in your life, you just kind of feel like you need to be moving forward. But it was a very valuable experience, as I'll talk about today. And uh, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think of it. So, um, And then a little bit of my personal history in that, because I know that we all have personal lives to fit into our careers. And um, so I went uh, and volunteered in East Timor right after um, I got married. So after my residency, we got married that summer. And then we went to, both of us, my husband and I, went to Doctors Without Borders in September. So you'll see some pictures of him. Um, in my slides as well. So feel free to ask questions as we go through. I will try to remember to repeat the question because we are um, being recorded. And, um, and then I'll also leave some time for questions at the end. Does anyone have any questions before we begin? Everyone's in the right place at the right time. OK. So Doctors Without Borders is a French organization. It's called Medicine Sans Frontier, or MSF. Um, I kind of had a little bit of conversation with people. And um, the experience that I'm going to be talking about is over a decade old. And, um, and uh, things have changed, but not all that much in uh, MSF. And I'm part of a return volunteer network for MSF. And I'm not aware of Stanford faculty who have gone more recently than I have. But if you are, I would love to, to hear about that and, and connect with them as well. So MSF was founded in 1971 in the wake of the Biafra crisis. So Biaf the Biafra War was a war that happened in Nigeria in 1971. And I know that one of the global health speakers um, in December, it was December 7th, because I went online and looked at the videos, a guy named Bert uh, Potnod spoke about sort of the um, evolution from the Red Cross to MSF. And, um, and I know not all of you were there uh, at that talk, but can anyone sort of briefly summarize how MSF is different, the main way that MSF is different from International Red Cross? OK, so the International Red Cross, um, it, it's very important to be, um, to have, to be nonpartisan with uh, the Red Cross. So the Red Cross did go into the Holocaust. They witnessed all of those atrocities, but they did not comment on them because it would limit their access to the Holocaust victims. So the main difference uh, with uh, MSF is that witnessing is a very important part of their process. And they have a French word for it called timonage, or witnessing. And so um, and this happened in the Biafra crisis, where uh, doctors, as part of the International Red Cross, went in. And they were mostly young French doctors. And they were witnessing what they thought was a genocide. There was debate about whether it was actually a genocide or not. And um, said, look, we can't um, be muzzled, as you're asking us to be in the Red Cross and not say anything to the world about what we're witnessing. So we're going to break off and create our own organization called Medicine Sans Frontieres. And a big part of our mission is going to be reporting on the things that we see. So that's sort of the main difference. And in all of the, the places that you go, you will see all of these different aid organizations um, and uh, even there's even a group that's broken off from Medicine Sans Frontieres called Medicine du Monde, MDM, uh, Doctors of the World. So, and each of them have um, 
little bit different flavor of how they practice humanitarian aid. But one thing that MSF is well known for is being able to mobilize quickly in a crisis and get on the ground and um, do things uh, effectively, which is what I experienced when I volunteered with them. So the MSF charter, so there are some things that are similar to uh, Red Cross, so ne neutrality and impartiality. So Red Cross will also be neutral and impartial when they go in to um, different situations. And they're also, um, both organizations are independent from all political, economic, or religious powers. So it's very important to realize that you know different governmental organizations have uh, different aid uh, portions, like USAID, but they all have different agendas. And so it's very important to remain impartial when you go in to humanitarian aid, because often you're in the middle of two sides of a conflict, and you need to uh, be able to provide care and show that you're not taking sides in providing that care. So um, MSF uh, makes that a very important part of their charter. And then again, the, um, the witnessing and being able to report on this is what uh, distinguishes MSF. So uh, they're neutral. This is a picture from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so they aid both sides of any conflict. They're impartial, so this is a picture from Liberia in 2007, and you can see that um, they have a picture here with a gun with an X through it. So basically, soldiers and people who are part of the conflict can come as long as they check their, their guns at the door. And they're independent, so it's, it's really important to realize that MSF doesn't get any funding from any governmental organization. They get most of their funding from people who write $5 checks in December. So 80% of their funding is very small amounts of money from lots of different people. And it helps them not be conflicted or biased in the care that they provide. So their med MSF has medical programs in more than 60 countries. So the countries that they have medical programs in are the ones that are slightly darker. And there's more than 27,000 field physicians. So that's people that are in these countries in the field. And there's 9% international staff. And that's a little misleading because not, when you say international, it means the, the people who are in the country. So when we went to East Timor, we hired East Timorese staff. So that makes up 9%. And then what they call the people who go from a different country into East Timor are expats or expat, expatriate staff. Um, they did more than 7.6 million patient consultations in 2010 around the world. There were 150,000 deliveries. So this is an important thing to remember if you ever think about doing humanitarian aid work, is that the demographics of the developing world are quite different than the demographics of where you're training, and um, that you're going to be taking care of a lot of pregnant women and children. And it's good to brush up on that. Um, and uh, I'll tell you about my own experience with that. And there are uh, 58,000 surgical interventions. So we were talking a little bit before. So the minimum uh, time commitment for an internist to go into MSF is six months. But they have some you know, specialized surgical missions that you can go for as little as two weeks. But you have to have those surgical skills. So the annual worldwide budget is $1.2 billion. 91% of funding comes from individuals, almost uh, 80% comes from individuals, and the rest comes from corporations and foundations. And at least 82% of the overall budget goes to program activities. So this is really important. Sometimes when you do donations, they give you a pie chart of you know, how much actually goes to the programs. And they say that you, know, you should look for programs that are 70% and above that go to the, the activities. And uh, MSF is 82%. And I can attest to that. Um, I know that you know, being residents, you're probably not, uh, you know, don't have the best expense accounts. But even, you know, when we wanted to go buy things when we were doing our training, like potato chips or, you know, beer, it was kind of all on our own nickel. And, um, and we weren't, we were volunteers. We weren't getting paid. So you really have to have a commitment to do that. So who volunteers? Medical doctors, as we talked about, and I said the minimum time commitment is six months. And it's important to realize that um, general surgeons, anesthesiologists, and doctors only make up 20% of Doctors Without Borders volunteers. 
The other 30% are nurses and midwives, because there's a lot of OBGYN. And then there's also a small proportion of nutritionists, epidemiologists, public health professionals, mental health professionals, administrators, logistic professionals, uh, WATSAN, or water and sanitation experts, and FNA, finance and administration. So they really have a whole team that goes out there and they create this little business in these remote areas and they take everything with them. So um, I think sometimes people, it's a little bit of a misnomer to call it Doctors Without Borders because it's only 20% doctors and there is this you know, whole other team. And you'll find that in order to practice medicine, I mean, you realize that you have a lot of support in order to do it. And you know, I'll tell you when we went to East Timor, we didn't know what side of the road to drive on. We didn't know what currency to use. There was no water, there was no shelter, and there was a lot of things that need to be in place before you can practice medicine. So we live in a really rarefied environment here, as, as you can imagine. What, uh, so the question is, what percentage do you think are paid staff? So um, when we were actually out in the field, we were technically paid. We were paid $700 a month while we were there. And of course, they provided shelter, they provided food while we were there. So the, what I was referring to earlier was that when we were in a training period, we went to like a training thing, we weren't paid. And then the local staff that we hire there are paid at local rates. So people are paid, but at, um, and, and this was a decade ago, so maybe you know, it's $800 a month or something now. But, and you can compare that to maybe your own resident salary. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not much. And really what it's designed to do is be able for you to pay for storage for your, you know, stuff while you're away, that's, and that's about it. Um, so the activities of Doctors Without Borders and what they're really known for and what they're very good at is responding to emergencies. They're just incredible. I mean, they have Land Rovers that are packed with everything that you need, and if there's an emergency, they load them onto planes, and they can literally drive off the plane with everything you need to provide medical care for a population in need. Um, and they provide medical support to populations without access to health care. They're very good at responding to chronic epidemics. They have a lot of uh, cholera programs and TB programs in Russian, um, in, uh, Russian jails. And, and again, uh, bearing witness, this is something that wasn't on the previous slide, but they had, when we were in East Timor, they had three people that were there just to write press releases every day. So they would come around and you know, talk to all of us and find out what the stories were. And, Every day, there would be 30 press releases that went out from East Timor. And then also, we were there the year they won the Nobel Prize. So that was even more um, PR than maybe they were usually used to. OK, so now I'm going to move into talking about my specific experience in East Timor, which was in 1999. Um, and does anyone have any general questions on Doctors Without Borders before we move to that? OK, so um, East Timor is a small little island nation that was formerly part of Indonesia, which is depicted here. Here's Australia, here's India, there's Malaysia and Singapore. And um, you can see that there are many, many islands, and it's, it may sort of not be intuitive why this small island, so this is half of that other island. So this whole island is called Timor, and T-I-M-U-R, that means east. Timor, Timor means East Timor. And um, this is the country, the capital is Dili. There's also a little part of East Timor over here in West Timor. So it might not be entirely clear why this little island is separate from Indonesia. And we have to kind of go back to colonial times to figure that out. So most of Indonesia was colonized by the Dutch. This teeny tiny little part was colonized by the Portuguese. And they had, obviously, different customs than the rest of the, the islands. And when the Portuguese left in 1975, so they, the Portuguese left and said, OK, East Timor, you're on your own. And they left because they didn't want to support this little colony. The, at that time, the Indonesian army basically just came over and took over East Timor because they didn't have an army to defend themselves or anything like that. So then for 25 years, there was this low-level resistance. And then there were lots of things that, as often in these conflicts, there's a socioeconomic reason for why there's conflict. And uh, East Timor, for instance, you know, had the fewest roads of any place in Indonesia. 
And then having been influenced by the Portuguese, they were a Catholic country, and the, the Indonesians had different policies, so they would come in and do forced sterilizations and that type of thing, and it wasn't, it's not something that sat well with a Catholic country. So there was this low-level resistance for a long time. And there were people who went to the UN and asked year after year, can we vote, can we vote, can we see if we can be separate from Indonesia. And then finally in 1999, the UN granted them a vote. And, and um, Doctors Without Borders was in East Timor even before the vote. So any questions on that conflict at all? Okay. So. So they decided that they were going to take a vote, but all along the Indonesian military, um, and you know, I'm, I'm sort of telling this like a story, but I don't mean to take sides in any way. I'm just sort of portraying the conflict the way it was. Um, the Indonesian army did fund what they called militia. Um, so they funded people in East Timor. So it wasn't the Indonesian army that was out there, the face of this conflict, but they had paramilitary. So uh, who they called militia. So here are some militia members. They have stones and machetes, and, and they're there to threaten the people uh, at the time that they wanted to come and vote. So this is all pre-voting that um, was the, the pictures on the streets. And this is people here with their voting papers standing in line to vote. Despite all of this um, terrorizing, there was still uh, a large proportion of the population that turned out to vote, 80% of the people in uh, Timor who were eligible to vote, voted, which is a lot less than voted yesterday, I'm sure, for us. Um, so this um, shows that there was violence during that time. So this is a ballot box. These are people guiding the ballot boxes. But these stones and things that you were seeing in the previous pictures were thrown in here to really um, instill fear in the people who were coming to vote. But despite that, people did come out to vote. And then this is a picture in Jakarta. So this is the Indonesian military in Jakarta. And these are students who are protesting the um, Indonesian occupation of uh, East Timor. Oops. So, so this is what happened. After the results of that vote came in, the um, the militia um, sort of went on a rampage. They burned down buildings. They turned over buses. They um, went from home to home and asked people to leave so they could burn down their homes. And sometimes it wasn't such a polite ask to leave. It was at gunpoint. They went um, to beaches. Some people estimate that over 100,000 people were killed in this aftermath um, of a massacre. And we, when we were there, you know, on a daily at first, almost weekly basis after that, finding mass graves uh, and, and bodies washing up on the shore. So this is a picture of um, people you know, trying to carry their belongings and go to the refugee camps, which were set up in West Timor and also um, Jakarta. So this is uh, pictures of people uh, getting on boats. So they were put on boats with their belongings, and here's a a small child. I apologize for the quality of these pictures. They were taken before digital imagery scanned in, and you know, so um, they don't look so great. Um, and this is another picture of, of the militia, um, and it was it was difficult to go out. Uh, we, it, as part of MSF, always had to travel in convoys. You always had to have um, walkie-talkies with you, and um, and I'll tell you, the MSF interview that I had was the hardest one I had. I'm sure you've all had wonderful interviews in your life because that's why you're here. But you know, most interviews go pretty well. People ask you why you want to do what you're doing, and you give a good answer, and it's generally a positive experience. In my interview for MSF, they said, you know, why do you want to do that? This, I gave them my answer, and it was always, you know, sort of a challenge. And they, they said to me, well, what do you what do you do when you're stressed out? And as many of you do, I said, well, I go for a run. And they said, well, what would you do if you couldn't go for a run? And I said, well, I don't know. I'd maybe do yoga or something like that. So, but you know, it, the questions they asked were very pertinent because I couldn't. I mean, you can't go outside for six months. So this is, so they were very prescient in asking you those questions about how you would handle stress. And it was very stressful. So this is a picture of a burned down um, house. This is where a house was and the tree that was burned down there. This is an overturned bus. 
Um, this is another house that was burned down. These are pictures of more um, cars that were burned and uh, another house and more cars. And it's interesting because, you know, we didn't really see a lot of this uh, actively happen, but it was because we had such security measures in place and we weren't allowed to go out after dark, you know, we kind of happened upon these things the next day when we um, were out going to the clinics that we were in. And more pictures of um, the cars and uh, being burned out. So this is a picture of a fountain that was right near the Dilly Airport where we flew in. Um, and there were no commercial flights, obviously, so we took the, um, the UN planes in. So this is uh, just some pictures of the graffiti. So um, this is a little bit in Bahasa. So um, it says autonomy. So it's like the word autonomy, but it's spelled O-T-O-N-O-M-I, yes. So they were you know, saying that they wanted autonomy from Indonesia. And um, so this is uh, the acronym for the Indonesian Army, TNI, and then it's uh, also referred to as the militia. So this says TNI or militia is, I'll let you read the rest. And then the, the group that we went in with was called Interfet, so it was the United Nations International Security Forces for East Timor. And so they write, we love Interfet, thanks for your security. So this is the first clinic that I had there. This is a soccer stadium, and they chose a soccer stadium to set it up because it's a, a place that's easy to defend. Um, and so you can see here's the refugees here. And um, we had one clinic, uh, or sorry, one tent to see people in, and one tent where we sutured lacerations and that type of thing in the back. And, um, and you can see the soldiers and sandbags in the corners of that soccer stadium. And we were there probably for the first two months living in tents. Those are UN soldiers. So the UN, each, so the, um, each country sends soldiers. So we actually had soldiers from all over the world that we worked with, but most of the this uh, particular UN uh, army was uh, Australia, because they were so close. And so these are, this is where people waited. So I know, you, you know, we all have hard days here, but there were 250 people waiting, and you know, you, they, they all knew exactly how long you were taking with each person, because they were watching you. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of privacy. There wasn't even a lot of water to wash your hands between patients, and this was, you know, before the days of hand sanitizer. I didn't have a lab. I didn't have x-ray. I didn't have anyone else to talk to to ask if, you know, you, do you think this spleen is big or not? Or do you think this conjunctiva is pale? And do you think they have malaria? And I only had 20 medicines in a box, in a blue box. And I went from arguing about whether I should give someone a third or fourth generation cephalosporin in an ICU to I have to figure out what they've got. And I've only got Bactrim or penicillin to give them. And I hope that works. And it's, and it's really interesting because we think of, you know, all of these wasting diseases. Uh, and I often wondered why they called them wasting diseases. But if you don't have any diagnostic material, it's hard to tell the difference between TB and cancer and HIV. And, um, and there are people who, who, who would just go and treat everyone as if they had HIV. But, you know, just hoping that it would work a third of the time. And you can do that type of thing in East Timor because there's no regulation or that type of thing. So this is pictures of some of the refugee that moved through the clinic. So this is a, a little girl among her belongings. This is a little boy who uh, waited a long time in the, in the clinic area that we were in. So we also um, saw people as they came back from the refugee camp from West Timor. Um, and they often came at night or at uh, very uh, untoward times, but we were <laughs> able to mobilize and set up clinics at 2 o'clock in the morning. So this is a picture of me, um, and we always wore these MSF shirts, so you could be recognized as a member of an aid organization and not a member of some other um, organization. 
so you can see that people are taking their belongings down. This is a, a truck that's unloading the um, boats. And we set up, so this is all MSF. We set up big spotlights so people could uh, see what they were doing in the middle of the night when they were unloading. And we gave everybody, um, so these are plastic buckets so people could do personal hygiene. And then they got a tarp so they could provide themselves some shelter. And then this is a little bag of rice that's on top of that. And, um, and, it's, and it's very interesting when you think about logistics because to, when, while MSF does a great job, for instance, we got everyone these tarps, but the first time we handed out these tarps, we realized there was no hardware store to go get nails to nail down the tarps or hammers or any of that type of thing. So we you know, put in a quick call to Darwin, which was an hour away by flight in Australia to get those things in order to um, provide people shelter. So this is a picture of my husband. And he worked with a Belgian uh, gentleman named um, Jacques, who uh, was a MSF veteran. He left, um, Jacques left his uh, pregnant wife at home and came and volunteered with MSF until she was about to deliver. And it was their first child. And my husband is not in medicine. He, um, he was an he was a engineer and then did sales. And he was, um, before we left, was basically trading stocks. And uh, when we went there, but he, so what he did was logistics. So he set up the clinics and made sure the water was clean. And right now they're setting up a generator for those lights that you see. Um, so my favorite story about going to MSF was there's no telephones, right? Because they cut all the telephone wires when you left. And this was before cell phones, and they had a sat phone, though, a satellite phone. And we each got um, a five-minute call on a satellite phone when we got there, which cost about $50 at the time. So I used my five-minute sat phone call to call my mom and my family and tell them that I was okay and you know we were moving forward. And my husband uses five minutes to call Charles Schwab and sell all of his options. <laughs> so um, so yeah, we were very we were living very different lives. So this is a picture of um, one of these tents uh, that we set up in the middle of the night to see returning refugees. This is a picture of me. This is a picture of my interpreter. So I had to have an interpreter to speak Tetum, which is the language that was spoke, spoken in East Timor, which was different than Bahasa Indonesia, which is spoken in the rest of Indonesia. And you see here that there's a, a, a television crew. This is a German television crew. And um, this was a time in 1999, so we went in September, and they won the Nobel Prize in October. So there were a lot, lots of PR that happened that at that time, mainly because of the Nobel Prize and also because East Timor was sort of a, a hot conflict at the time. But um, you, you realize when you're in these humanitarian aid uh, situations that a lot of the organizations are vying for attention from these television crews. So whoever gets on the cameras and who is in front of the world news, they're the organizations that are going to get the $5 checks that are written. So it's interesting that you know, you're in sort of this nonprofit world, and yet there is still some competition in a way for something, in this case, media attention. So this is a picture of um, the water supply. So they ran a water supply. And it's covered by a tarp. Um, and then this is what it looks like underneath the tarp. So the thing that we worried about a lot with something like this was malaria, malaria exactly. And that, there was a lot of endemic malaria there. Um, this is, so we, we had three clinics at the time that I was there for, for in six months. So the first clinic was the two tents. This is the second clinic. This is a school gymnasium. This is the gymnasium of a school where people are staying. That's where they're living. This is the rice uh, that they're consuming. And then there were two classrooms back here, which was the second clinic that we um, were in. And I'll show you a picture of the third one here in a minute. So the, as things are stabilizing, we're able to, you know, get a little bit more, um, solid uh, surroundings, I guess. So this is back to the, um, the soccer stadium. So now the soccer stadium is being used mainly for, for these tent camps. So this is a picture of the house that we eventually moved into after we um, left the, the camping conditions in the soccer stadium. And you can see the MSF logo there. 
and um, and there were 20 people that were living in this house with one bathroom, and we uh, didn't have a flush toilet, but it was a Western style of toilet where we poured water down. Um, and the most treacherous thing about that house was that there were lots of cockroaches. So um, this was our honeymoon suite where we stayed, and uh, so this is a foam mattress on the ground with mosquito netting, which is very important, as you can see. So a large part of the violence afterwards meant that we still had like sort of a dresser, but like there was no mirror in there because that was all broken. And then uh, there are some pictures from our wedding and some raid, which was very important for all the cockroaches. This was our dresser where we stored our clothes, and so you can see that um, things were pretty primitive. And we had it, so this is my headlamp for the, the nighttime thing. So this is a picture of the first um, market that opened up after all of this violence. So trade did start to happen. And um, this was, you know, they sold fruits and vegetables here. And then this man is also selling something else. Can anyone see what that looks like? Get a little bit closer. So one of the things I told you were endemic was TB. And we all know how difficult multi-drug resistant TB is. And, and this is something that's just being sold in the market. So people have a cough. Maybe they're coughing up blood. Maybe they had TB before the conflict, and they knew that they had to continue treating it. But can you imagine just having your patients go to the market and buying maybe a little isoniazid, maybe a little tetracycline, or whatever they can afford? So you can imagine how multi-drug resistance becomes a big problem very quickly. So this is a picture of the last clinic that we had, and it was a very nice clinic. My husband um, participated in building this, and we had a real waiting room and two exam rooms, and then we had sort of a pharmacy as well. So it was um, it was really getting to look like you know more real life. Um, and then at the end of six months, uh, they really, so I told you I always work through an interpreter, and I know probably in many cases that you work through interpreters here as well, and you may know that those interactions aren't sometimes as good as having interactions in a language that you're comfortable with. And that's something that MSF has recognized, and they told me that it was better for me to train an Indonesian doctor in, you know, how to use my little blue box of medicines than to, you know, continue to work through an interpreter. So. So usually in an acute conflict, they'll have lots of expatriate staff that go in. So there were 20 expatriate staff when we went in. But now in East Timor, there's only two expatriate staff. There'll be a medical lead and a logistics lead. And then the rest will all be national staff. But they'll be working with resources provided by MSF. And, um, and there can be some conflicts in that handoff as well. I mean, you have to realize that you're working in an international situation and um, you know and as I was sort of working with the Indonesian doctor for the trade-off she was um, you know kind of handing out penicillin for every URI that came through and you know and then we had a talk about how most of these things are viral and that you know penicillin would lead to a lot of drug resistance but you know there were was that education that needed to go on but you know you can imagine that that might be hard to um, maintain as, you know, there's more and more handoffs that, that go on. So um, this is a picture of, uh, so this is me here. This is um, my interpreter. And this is the picture in the last clinic. So you can see that it's a little bit, um, we actually have some gloves finally. These are some MSF books that they have, you know, handbooks on how to handle different uh, situations and then the family um, that we're taking care of in the back. So it did get a lot better in a very short amount of time. Um, but there was still, you know, at the end there was still Untayet forces. So this is just a regular day in East Timor and you have a soldier with a gun aimed at, um, you know, looking out for any potential conflict and, you know, still tanks in the street and that type of thing. And this is just another picture of that. And then um, it was very uh, cute, actually. They had um, a picture of 
so you can see this is uh, this is TIM team visita so the visitors versus uh, our team or us and so they at one point had uh, a soccer game of the soldiers and the um, people from East, East Timor so it was nice to see some of these more normal activities coming back this is a picture of East Timor. It's a beautiful country. If you ever get a chance to go there, you probably have to fly through Australia to get there. Um, there is a, a beach here at the end. Uh, we used to call it Jesus Beach because it had a picture of, or a, a statue of Jesus similar to Rio de Janeiro. And uh, we went. We used to go there on Sunday afternoons, which was the only time that we had off. We worked all day Saturday, half day Sunday, and. Um, but then there were alligators there, so then we didn't go there anymore. <laughs> so. Um, so this is a picture of Zanana Guzmao, who was, um, who was part of the resistance for that 25 years. And, um, and then after the conflict was over and they were able to elect their first leader, he was um, the first president of East Timor. And this is a picture of the, the plane that we flew out on. And then since I've been back, um, I've done various uh, return volunteer network stuff <laughs> with uh, Doctors Without Borders. And then Doctors Without Borders has lots of other um, initiatives, including one for orphan medications. And um, so they had a traveling exhibit. This was a few years ago. It was called It's a Different World Without Medicines. And it was set up here at Town and Country. So. Um, they have lots of good projects that you can get involved in, even on a local level. So that's the end of my slide. So I'll take uh, any questions if there are any. So you said for internal medicine docs, it's six months for specialists. Is that the same as specialists within internal medicine? The thing about um, specialists is that you have to practice as an internist. And even as an internist, you kind of have to practice as a family practice doctor. So, so, you know, the story I didn't tell you is also when I went there, um, you know, I had a one week overlap with the doctor before me. And I told you, you know, I'm coming from, you know, congestive heart failure and heart attacks and stuff like that. And then I go, and then I forgot you had to weigh kids before you dose them antibiotics, you know. So fortunately, I had this one week overlap where, you know, they taught me those things. But yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's great to have those skills. The other thing that's a little hard about Doctors Without Borders is that they kind of work off of the, the uh, European system of training. So, so I don't know if you've talked to people who've trained in Europe, but when they're at the end of their internal medicine, they almost have as much clinical practice as, as we do after medical school, you know, because we have those two years after medical school. But they only really get a lot of contact with patients during their internship. And um, so that's why they require three years after medical school in order to volunteer with Doctors Without Borders. But three years after medical school for us, we're pretty well differentiated into our specialty. So I don't think that's such a good, good model for us. But they do require three years. So you can't almost go after medical school, which I think would be a really good time. Or maybe after a year of internship or something like that. Is anyone thinking about doing it? A little bit, yeah. It's a great experience. Yeah. I know you guys don't take sides, but do you ever, like, do you ever get, like, in a place like this that had a very recent conflict, would you ever get blowback from the side that maybe doesn't like what you're doing because you're helping the people that they're opposed to? Does that make sense? Yes, and you have to be very careful about not even appearing to take sides, you know, and um, and there's a lot of uh, and that's what the logistics people are very good at because you know you're there to do your job, see patients, and you do what you can. But there are people around you who are just all day long talking to everybody, you know, talking to the militia, talking to the people who are there, and saying, "Look, you know, we're please come to our clinic. You know, we're not associated with the the army, and we're not associated with the government. We're not associated with the Indonesians or the." Militia, and, the, and there needs to be a lot of you know PR and marketing that goes on, which I didn't appreciate as a physician. I wouldn't have done that. I probably would have just put my head down and done my thing and sort of let the chips fall where they may, which is sometimes not such a good idea. And I'll give you an example. So I really coveted the, um, so the French army is also quite amazing, 
logistics wise. You know, they can they s set up a surgical hospital in like a week in East Timor. And oftentimes, you know, I, I told you my struggles with not having a lab or a, you know, a, to even microscope to look at things. And, um, and sometimes I would go there to, to use their facilities because I thought it would help me take care of patients. But, you know, they were very clear at Doctors Without Borders that I couldn't wear my shirt when I was going in there. I just had to go in as a separate, you know, person. And, and this is probably the biggest mistake I made in East Timor, but one time, um, you know, just again, got my little blue box of medicines and a truck pulls up, like a, you know, kind of a big U-Haul moving van kind of thing. Um, and in the back, there, and there was no windows in the back, and in the back there were about 20 people. And they open up the back of the truck because someone had directed them to this, there, there was a clinic here. And, and everyone is bloody. And, you know, I look around, there's lacerations, there's I, what I think is a hemothorax, and and I'm like, I can't do anything here. All I've got is, you know, this is my blue box of medicine. So I get in the back of the truck with my interpreter, and I'm examining people, trying to figure out, you know, what happened. And then I ask through the interpreter what happened. Because what I thought was that they had been attacked and that, you know, they had been tortured and put back in here and, and sent over here. So I get in the back of the truck, and I ask through the interpreter what happened here, you know, why, why is there so much damage? And I tell them to drive to the French... Um, Army Hospital, which is like a mile away. And then they say through the interpreter, oh, there, there was a car accident. And I said, oh, well, you know, it seems so weird. Everyone seems so tossed around. And then they said, oh, <laughs> they said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, why did they have this car accident? Did they run into anyone? And it didn't really look like there was a lot of damage on that car. And they said, well, the brakes don't work <laughs> on this car. So, you know, if you're ever in that situation, it's called the domino effect. You know, you've got to figure that out before you get in the back of the truck. Uh, but fortunately, we somehow made it to the French hospital and, and got everyone taken care of. But, um, yeah, you really have to, to know your limitations. And, and MSF was very good in counseling me to not, um, to not look like you have associations with other army and military and government. But um, sometimes I felt like I needed it to do more than what I could, which was frustrating. choose where you go or is it assigned to you? So you, it, is, it is given to you as a um, option. So, and that's hard too because you get, so I got done with my residency and I was waiting um, for an assignment, right? But conflict like East Timor doesn't come up at, you know, you get done with your residency on Friday and you can't start on Monday. So you're waiting around, which is very difficult for us. And also it was difficult for me and my husband to get placed together. It could only be in an acute situation because, um, as I said, as it gets to be more stable, they would um, only send one expatriate staff. So we had to sit around basically waiting for an emergency. And uh, we, we were given, I think, one, one option before in Africa, but it was, it was um, I think only one of us could go, so we said no to that one. And then, um, and then East Timor itself, or sorry, Doctors Without Borders themselves would not have sent us to Sri Lanka, which was also an active conflict at that time, because um, I have a Tamil heritage, and that that was part of the conflict. So they don't want to, you know, send you into some place where you could be perceived as part of. The conflict. So, um, so then East Timor came up, and even <coughs> in fact for East Timor. I so sh showed you the picture of East Timor, and um, there was, uh, we were told initially that we were going to go to um, a place called Lakeisha, um, which was sort of, it had a hospital, and they said I would start a TB program, and I was very comfortable in that situation because I thought, okay, well, you know, I could do that, coming from internal medicine residency. But then when we got there, they said, no, we changed our minds, you know, you're going to go to Dili, which was really a lot more conflicted because the other one was a little more inland. And I was so stressed out, I remember making that decision in Darwin that I was literally like dipping chocolate in coffee because it was like the two things that I used to manage stress. <laughs> um, but we decided to go and we were fine. So, but it, it's definitely a decision, you know, you have to, and my husband's parents thought I was crazy, you know, like taking their son to, to this place.
can survive. And most people do uh, the thing that people have um, who have died before. <laughs> most of in, in Doctors Without Borders is actually um, car accidents, which you know is what happens here as well. So the question is, um, how has the experience in East Timor changed how I practice medicine here? And I will say that there's not a day that goes by that I don't think of it and realize how fortunate we are to pr practice medicine the way that we do here. And um, it really definitely puts things into perspective. Um, I remember I was in my preventive cardiology fellowship um, on 9-11 and um, I was seeing patients and, you know, sometimes uh, our patients here can get a little uh, impatient if they have to wait, you know, half an hour. And it was on 9-11, so, you know, that morning things are happening and I'm, you know, half an hour late to my uh, second patient and, um, and they were, you know, irritated by this. But I remember, you know, the whole day, people would wait the whole day in a soccer stadium to see me and, you know, and they knew I was working because, you know, they saw me see everyone before them. But um, definitely, I think, what I take from it is that, that we're very fortunate to even be able to practice medicine the way that we do here. And, um, and that, uh, you know, really puts every day into perspective because my worst day here was, is, is better than my best day in East Timor. Okay, so if there's no more questions, I will uh, wrap it up. Thank you so much. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.